Welcome to Life Church. We're so glad you've chosen to join us online for another life changing message. We would love to have you experience God's presence with us in person at one of our exciting services at 3688 Highway 109 North in Lebanon, Tennessee. If you're watching on social media, be sure to like, follow, share, and subscribe. On our website, lifechurchfamily.com, you can learn more about us, get directions and service times, watch many of our previous sermons, or make a donation to help us continue to share God's Word in our region and around the world. Again, just go to lifechurchfamily.com. Here's the message. You know my laziness has reached epic proportions. Now I don't even plan to stand when I preach. I'm going to be on the couch. Not just a chair. I want to be able to lay down while I preach the Word. No, no, no. It's The title of the message is Get Up Off the Sofa. Uh, for those of you that are getting frightened because, like me, you're terribly out of shape and do not exercise, don't worry. This is not four weeks of teaching on, on why you should be in shape or why you should eat healthy, okay? That's not what it's going to be about. And uh, can I just get on my soapbox for 60 seconds? You know, just a little bit. Now, listen, there are so many benefits to exercising and eating well, and I'm all for that. But just would you do me a favor and stop taking 1 Corinthians chapter 6 out of context and going, your body is the temple of God, so you need to take care of it. That verse is not talking about healthy eating. It's not talking about exercise. It's talking about sexual immorality. Hello. There are plenty of other verses on gluttony you could pull out to use. Don't pull 1 Corinthians 6 out and blow it up into something it's not. But anyway, uh, uh, there are a lot of benefits to exercise. Just uh, thought I'd throw uh, this out here for you to think about. Medline did an article detailing all of the terrible effects that comes from being a couch potato. You know, our sermon series is get up off the couch. Well, you might want to get up off your literal couch, your literal sofa occasionally, because listen to all of these terrible health effects from just being a couch potato and sitting around on the couch eating potato chips all day. Uh, obesity, heart disease, coronary artery disease, heart attacks, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, stroke, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, certain cancers, including colon, breast, and uterine cancers, osteoporosis and falls, and an increase in feelings of depression and anxiety. Wow, a lot of terrible things happen when you're a couch potato. But can I give you some good news? They went on, <coughs> excuse me, they went on to uh, throw out some good news. If you're willing to get up off the sofa and get out there and become active and exercise, they say science has proven you can reverse the effects of being a couch potato. So there's you some good news. But listen, again, this four-week series we're kicking off today is not about your need to exercise or my need to exercise. It's about another SOFA. We're using SOFA. It's, it's an acronym, S-O-F-A, and it stands for Stubbornness, Offense, Fear, and Anger. And let me tell you, if you spend time sitting on that sofa, uh, S-O-F-A, it will cause you far more problems than sitting on a regular couch will. Hello? If you keep sitting on stubbornness, offense, fear and anger, it's going to cause a lot of damage. Now, I want to I kick off the sermon this morning talking about stubbornness. Just curious, how many of you have ever heard a pastor preach an entire sermon just on the topic of stubbornness? Raise your hand. I see one, two hands, maybe. I got to thinking about it this week as I was preparing this message. And by the way, thanks to Pastor Stephanie Oliver. She really had the vision for this sermon series back when we were doing the emotion series. There were some topics we didn't cover and some attitudes we didn't cover. And so we felt like we needed to continue on. And she had this great idea for calling this series Get Up Off the Sofa. So kudos to her for her creativity there. Bringing that up in staff meeting, yeah. But I got to thinking about it as I was preparing this kickoff message on stubbornness. I've never, ever, ever heard a pastor preach a sermon on it. At least, at least not exclusively. Maybe it got mentioned briefly as a passing thought during some other sermon, but never really talked about. And I think that's because we don't really think of stubbornness as a sin. I mean, you know, really, if we do think of it as a sin, it's somewhere down there way below gossip, you know? It's not like a big deal or anything. It's, it's you know, yeah, well, and people say this, well, you know, I'm just a little stubborn. 
Just remember, when you say, I'm just a little stubborn, what you're really saying is, I'm just a little sinful. Let me go to this side. They may amen me louder. I'm just kidding. I got to start off, though. I got this incredible video, but I got to give you the backstory on it. There's this little toddler, cutest thing in the world, who loves green apples, okay? Loves green apples, gets up on the counter and sees what he or she thinks is a green apple, only it's not an apple. It's a raw onion. And so the toddler is stubborn. And even though mom has said, sweetie, that's not a green apple, that's an onion, the toddler is determined to eat it and think that it is a green apple. Take a look. Take a look at this video. It's awesome. Takes another bite. <laughs> there go the eyes watering and burning. She's coughing. He's coughing. Keeps going. Okay, that's what you call stubbornness. That's what you call stubbornness. I mean, it's burning their eyes. It's burning their mouth. It's making them cough. I mean, it's miserable. It tastes bad, but that kid's determined. That's a green apple, and I'm going to eat the green apple, even though mom and dad have said it's not an apple. It's no, no. I'm determined. I'm going to eat that. Let's, can we just be honest? How many of us? Have had some green, have had some onions in our life that we were stubborn about. And even though, even though everybody told us, don't do it or make sure you do it, even though all the, all the proof, all of the signs pointed toward the fact that we should or shouldn't do things, we just still, we just moved right along and did what we wanted to do, even though it caused pain, even though it caused suffering, even though it brought some tears. And yeah, that's called stubbornness. Let me read you the dictionary definition of stubborn, okay? Stubborn, it means having or showing persistent determination not to change one's attitude or position on something in spite of having good arguments or reasons not to do so. I mean, that little, that little kid had a lot of reasons to quit eating that onion. But nevertheless, no matter how much uh, they coughed, no matter how much they, they got choked up or their eyes began to burn, stubbornness said, that's an apple. I don't care what you say, and I'm going to eat it. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. 1 Samuel 15, verse 23. And this is the section of Scripture where we're... we're learning about Saul, who became king. And at this point, this is where God rejects Saul as king and says, that's it. I'm no longer going to place my anointing on you. I'm no longer going to recognize you as king. Um, 1 Samuel 15, verse 23. Now, again, I think the reason we don't preach on stubborn this very much, even though it's mentioned throughout Scripture, and I'm going to read you a lot of passages today. Even we don't preach on it because we don't really think it's a sin. Well, you know, it's just maybe it's an attitude, or you know, I just sometimes I can be a little stubborn. Listen, it's serious. Everybody say it's serious. Here's how serious it is. First Samuel 15, verse 23, it says, Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft. This is God speaking to Saul through the prophet Samuel. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. God said being stubborn is just as sinful as worshiping a false god. And you know, listen, he... he, he judged Israel harshly over worshiping idols. But he says it's just as bad. Then he goes on to say, so because you have rejected the command of the Lord, because you were stubborn, the Lord has rejected you as king. Now you think about this. 
David committed far more sins numerically than Saul did. I mean, Saul never raped a woman, and that's basically what David did to Bathsheba. He forced her into a sexual relationship because of his position, and then he murdered her husband, and then he lied and covered it all up. Saul didn't do any of those things, yet God did not reject David as king. Instead, David repented because he wasn't stubborn. He repented. He heard the word of the Lord. And ultimately in the end, we're told in the book of Acts that David was a man after God's own heart. Yet God says to Saul, that's it. I'm done with you. I reject you as king. Because let me tell you something, folks. God takes stubbornness seriously. Hello? Look at Exodus chapter 32. Go down to verse 9. Exodus 32 verse 9 and 10 says, then the Lord said, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them and I will destroy them. Wow. I mean, think about it. There's only one time that we know God coming down and just destroying a massive group of people. Remember, he took out the entire city of Sodom and Gomorrah, but that was sexual immorality, specifically homosexuality. God wiped out an entire city, yet God said... For stubbornness, I'll take out an entire nation. Fortunately, Moses, you know, came and and interceded on their behalf and God relented. But God was so angry over their stubbornness, he said, I'm going to wipe you all out. Moses, I'm going to give you a whole fresh nation to work with. I'll send you another bunch of people. But these people, I'm, I'm tired of them because God hates stubbornness. Look at Exodus 33, verse 3. He said, go up to the land that flows with milk and honey. But I will not travel among you, for you are a stubborn and rebellious people. He said, I'm not going with you. If you want to go, go. God says, I'm not going with you. Why? He said, because if I did, I would surely destroy you along the way. God said, you guys can go, but if I walk with you right now with your stubborn attitude, I'll take you out. Kind of like the parent that says, I brought you into this world. I know how to take you out. No, God said, that's it. I mean, that stubbornness is just too much. He said, you know, I can't even walk with you because I'd end up destroying you because I hate stubbornness. Deuteronomy 9 verse 13 says, The Lord also said to me, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious. Everybody say stubborn and rebellious. You notice all four of the verses I've read you thus far, it said rebellious and stubborn or stubborn and rebellious. That's because there's twin siblings. Where you find one, you usually find the other, and they look almost identical. God's constantly linking rebellion and stubbornness together. (laughs) And the reason is people who are stubborn do not like authority. People who are stubborn do not like to be told what to do. They don't like submission. You see, stubbornness rebels against submission. They don't want to be corrected. They don't want to be told what to do. They don't want to hear you preach on verses that say submit to those in authority and honor the king and do what your master tells you to do and submit to your spouse. We don't want to hear those kind of things because stubbornness rebels against submission. 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 8 says, Do not be stubborn as they were, but submit yourselves to the Lord. Listen, stubbornness doesn't want to submit to God's Word. Because you'll still say this. Well, I, I know the Bible says that, but. I know what, what I probably ought to do, but. Everybody say, quit being a but. Okay, start start listening to the Word of God. Start submitting to authority. You need to do that. It's important. Let me define this word stubborn from the Hebrew. The, the word stubborn there is translated from the Hebrew word kasha. And the word kasha means this severe, cruel, grievous, hard-hearted, obstinate, rough, sore, sorrowful, stiff-necked. I like this last one, in trouble. Stubbornness will get you in trouble. It will cause a lot of problems in your life. Go back to the definition again. It's, it says that it will make you sorrowful. It'll make you grieve. Listen, I'm, I'm telling you folks, stubbornness will bring a lot of pain and a lot of suffering, a lot of sorrow into your life. It says those that are stubborn are obstinate and hard-hearted. Nobody will be able to get through to you no matter how much truth they bring, no matter how much reason they bring, no matter how much what they're saying makes sense. If you're stubborn, you'll be hard-hearted and you won't listen. Being, being stubborn, is one of the definitions was the word rough. 
See, being stubborn makes you a rough person, an abrasive person. You'll find out stubborn people get fired a lot. Stubborn people get overlooked for jobs a lot. Stubborn people ruin a lot of friendships, alienate a lot of family members, tend to not make very good parents and not make very good spouses. They wreck a lot of marriages because they're rough. People just don't like stubborn people. You're rough. You're abrasive. You rub people the wrong way. And then it said that stubbornness is cruel. When you are a stubborn person, you'll be cruel to other people, but ultimately you'll be cruel to yourself. You'll ruin your own life because stubbornness brings trouble. You see, stubbornness rebels against authority. Uh, number two, stubbornness rejects instruction and truth. I mean, the instruction will be clear, but you'll say, well, I know what it says, but again, stop being a but, stop, stop saying but, and just do what the Word says to do. Hello? I promise you, if God's Word says to do it, it's the right thing to do. Obey God's Word. Obey, listen, listen to the the advice of wise people that God's put in your life. Listen to Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 16. But our ancestor, ancestors were proud and stubborn. There's another sibling. That's the baby brother of, of, of stubbornness is pride. I, I know I'm right. I'm, I'm, just, I'm so great. I'm right. Pride and stubbornness. He says, they, he says they were proud and stubborn, and they paid no attention to your commands. When you're stubborn, You'll pay no attention to good advice. You'll pay no attention to the word of the Lord. You'll pay no attention to the things you ought to pay attention to because you're prideful. You're stubborn. You won't listen. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 9. These people are stubborn rebels. There's that word rebellion again. Who refuse to pay attention to the Lord's instruction. Everybody say, I will listen to the word and obey the word. Even when the Word doesn't agree with your lifestyle and your choices in life, it just means you need to change. Stop being stubborn. Stop refusing to change. Stop being hard-headed and obstinate. Stop being rough. And let the Word of God come in and show you how you ought to live. Third thing I want to point out, stubbornness refuses to change. Matter of fact, stubborn people view change as the ultimate enemy, unless, of course, it's their idea to change. Then the whole world ought to line up with them and change, right? Stubbornness doesn't like change. Psalm 78, verse 8 says, Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. Notice it said they refuse to give their hearts to God. I'm not going to change. I'm not giving up my heart. I'm not giving up my ways because I'm proud and I'm rebellious and I think my ideas are better than anyone else's. That's the stubborn person. They can't listen to anybody else because they always think they're right. Psalm 81, verse 12. I will let them follow their own stubborn desires, living according to their own ideas. See, when you're stubborn in marriage, you don't listen to your spouse. You don't want to hear what they have to say because you've got your idea of what marriage ought to be like. You don't want to listen to your boss at work because you think you know how the job ought to be done more than they know how the job ought to be done. And when you're the employer, you'll never listen to your employees because you think, I'm the boss. I'm always right. Therefore, I don't have to listen to anybody. Um, I'm going to share with you a little something that I've, I've shared part of this before, but I'll share it again. I don't do a lot of counseling. I will do pre-marriage counseling for those whom I'm marrying. And occasionally, Christy and I will do a little marriage counseling. But in general, we try to stay away from counseling. One reason is, I just know there are a lot of people more qualified in our church to counsel than I am. Pastor Stephanie's about to have her PhD in counseling and psychology. We've got somebody in our church about to have their master's degree in childhood psychology. We've got other counselors in the church. I, on the other hand, had two courses in Bible college on counseling. That's it. And so I feel like there are people far more qualified than me that can do a better job. So I typically hand that off, again, except for pre-marriage counseling. Uh, second reason that I don't do it is because people get really, really, really uncomfortable sitting in service, listening to a pastor every Sunday and every Wednesday after they've spilled all of their junk out there for him to know. And they tend to think every sermon is about them, although it's not. So, you know, uh, it does, and another reason, uh, statistics show 85 to 90 percent of people who get counseled by the lead pastor end up leaving the church because they feel so uncomfortable. Uh, another reason uh, that I don't like to counsel is because I find a lot of people don't really want to change. They just want to complain. 
You just want to take up 30 minutes or an hour of somebody's time so you can sit there and dish your husband and dish your job and talk about how bad your life is when you don't want to change. See, I, I, don't, I don't have so much a counseling personality as a mentor personality because the counselor is about dealing with your problems and helping you work through your problems. I'm focused on your potential. Which brings me to another reason I don't counsel. Now, when, when I went through pastoral counseling training and you know, took those courses in Bible college, they said, you're not supposed to change anything. It's not your job to give them advice. Your job is to listen and then just mirror back to them what they said so that through self-examination, um, self, uh, 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 they can fix their own problems. I got too big a mouth for that. Again... Again, I'm, I'm focused on your potential. And if I see you doing something dumb that's keeping you from reaching your potential, this big mouth pastor is going to say something. I don't want to just mirror back what you said. And I want to, listen, quit doing this. This is dumb. This is goofy. Change your life. So for that reason, I, uh, I don't do a lot of counseling. But one of the key things that, that, that I find, though, is really a lot of people say they want counseling, but they don't want to change. And I'm just going to be honest with you. If you're not willing to listen, if you're not willing to accept instruction, if you're not willing to change, stop wasting your counselor's time and your money. Hello. Save yourself some money. Save your counselor some time. And just, I don't know, just complain on Facebook like everybody else in the world does. Just throwing that out there. I think I got on the soapbox again. I apologize. Stubborn people don't want to change because they're unbending. Look at Isaiah chapter 46, verse 4. How many of you did not know there were this many verses in the Bible about stubbornness? Isaiah 40, 48, verse 4. For I know how stubborn and obstinate you are. Your necks are as unbending as iron. And I like the last half. Your heads are as hard as bronze. Hard-headed. Elvis Presley sang a song that said, Hard-headed woman been a thorn in the side of man since Adam and Eve. Hard-headed men have been a problem too. Amen. Hard-headed men. Let me, let me, I know I got to walk out of here and I don't want to get shot. Okay. I just, you know, some of you women are packing. So I, I men too can be hard-headed. Just, just protecting myself there. No, people are unbending. You don't want to compromise. You don't want to think that you could be wrong. You don't want to change. That's part of stubbornness. And, and again, stubborn people tend to view change as their greatest enemy because again, they only want to change when it's their idea to change. Isaiah 57, 17. This is God talking again. Listen to what God says. I was angry, so I punished these greedy people. I withdrew from them, but they kept going on their own stubborn way. Wow, God said, I got angry, they kept being stubborn. I uh, punished them, they kept being stubborn. I finally withdrew from them, but because they were stubborn, they just kept doing the same crazy, silly, foolish things. That's what stubbornness does. So you see, stubbornness, it, re it rebels against instruction and authority. Uh, it it re rebels against submission. It doesn't like instruction and truth. And, uh, and boy, stubborn people, they just, they're unbending. They're cruel. They hurt people. Well, now, well, now the question is this, how can I get up off the couch? How can I get up off the couch of stubbornness? All right, number one, let me give you five ways to uh, get up off the couch of stubbornness. Number one, become a listener. That's something stubborn people don't like. They want to be heard. They don't necessarily want to be listened to. Become a listener. Jeremiah 7 verse 24 says, but my people would not listen to me. They kept doing whatever they wanted following the stubborn desires of evil heart. Then it says, look, they went backward instead of forward. Until you become a listener, you're going to keep going backward in life. Until you learn to listen to God, listen to his word, listen to the wise people that he's put around you, you're going to keep going backward. Number one, listen to God. Okay, I said this earlier, I'll say it again. His word and his way is always the right way. Listen to God. Number two, listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you. Let, let the peace of God rule in your life. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Also, listen to wise people as long as they don't contradict God's Word. 
There's a reason God puts wisdom in other people, not just you. It's because he wants them to share that information with you. So become a listener. Employees, listen to your boss. They're the boss for a reason. Employers, listen to your employees. There's a good possibility they may know a way to do it cheaper, to do it faster, to do it more uh, uh, with more quality. Listen to your employees. They may have some really good advice to share and could make your company much better if you would just listen. Spouses, listen to your, to your wife, your husband. Listen and learn. Okay, number one, become a listener if you want to overcome stubbornness. Number two, be filled with the Spirit. Be spirit Filled. Ezekiel chapter 11 verse 19 says, And I will give them singleness of heart and put a new what? Spirit within them. I will take away their stony, stubborn heart. I'll take away the stony, stubborn heart and give them a tender, responsive heart. See, the stubborn person doesn't have a tender, responsive heart. And sometimes, I'm just going to be honest, sometimes your stubbornness is so deeply rooted in who you are that only the Holy Spirit can change that. It's going to take a supernatural work of God taking His Holy Spirit and transforming you. That's what you're going to need if you're going to overcome stubbornness. Uh, also, you need to learn to pray in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit will help you overcome um, will help you overcome stubbornness, and here's why. Well, first of all, 1 Corinthians 14, 15 says, I will pray in the Spirit, and I will also pray with words I understand. In other words, I'll pray in unknown tongues, because that's one of the gifts that are available to those who are baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'll pray in tongues, Paul said, but I also pray in my native language, one that I understand. Well, why would? I, how is praying in tongues going to help me overcome uh, you know, stubbornness and being obstinate. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 26. It says, And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. Now, stubborn people always think they always know everything, including what they ought to pray for. But it says we don't always know what we ought to pray for. Then it says, But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. In other words, when we don't know what we ought to pray or when we're too stubborn to pray what we ought to pray, if you'll just pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit will override you and communicate to God directly what you really need in your life. Amen? You need to be filled with the Spirit. You need, if, you, if you have the gift of tongues, you need to be using that gift, praying. Say, God, allow me to pray in the Spirit. That way you can override your ignorance, override your stubbornness, and the Holy Spirit will pray about the things you don't even realize you need to pray about. Number three. Number one is become a listener. Number two is be filled with the Spirit. Number three, ask God to help you lower your defenses. This is what you may not know about stubbornness. Stubbornness is really sort of a, uh, an auto-defense mechanism. Look at, look at Ezekiel 11 verse 19. He said, And I will give them singleness of heart and put a new spirit within them. I will take away their stony, stubborn heart. Now, we read this just a minute ago, but I want to point out stony, stubborn heart. The, the, the root word of those words is a word that means this. It means, it means to guard, to protect, and to keep watch. See, a lot of times when a person is stubborn, what they're really doing, they're trying to protect themselves due to what they've experienced in their past, the wounds, the offenses. And by the way, the next word in the series, uh, the, the O is for offense. You need to be here next week to hear the teaching on offense because if you don't deal with the offenses in your life, you're going to continue to struggle with stubbornness. Because again, stubbornness tends to be an auto-response mechanism. You're, you're automatically being obstinate, automatically being hard-hearted because you think, I'm not going to let somebody hurt me again. I'm not going to be taken advantage of. I'm not going to be betrayed again. And you're, you, you put up your auto-defense mechanism. It's just like the skunk sprays to drive people away. The porcupine lifts up those quills to say, don't you touch me, don't get close to me. The rattlesnake shakes his rattlers, the bear growls, because you sometimes with your auto-defense mechanism, you immediately go into stubborn mode. Uh, think about this. Stubbornness can manifest itself in many different ways as a, as a defense mechanism. One is arrogance. Arrogance, you feel superior to everybody else. Again, a lot of times you feel superior not because you really think you're superior, but because you're compensating for your lack of security. You're actually an insecure person 
You don't have a lot of confidence, so you try to project that confidence and convince yourself and everyone else that you're really great, and so you end up developing, developing this arrogance, uh, acting all-knowing. I know everything. I, I don't want to hear it from anybody else. I don't want anybody to correct me because I'm a know-it-all. I know everything. This is a big one, sarcasm. Sarcasm. Stubbornness loves to manifest as sarcasm. Uh, this is probably a, a big one too, being inflexible. I can't change. I, 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 can't even, I can't even change my schedule. My schedule's got to remain the same all the time. I'm going to do things the same way every day. I'm going to shop at the same store, and I'm going to listen to the same music, and I'm going to do all the same. You're, you're totally inflexible. Stubbornness. This, however, I think is probably the most common uh, manifestation of stubbornness. Arguing and debating. Arguing and debating. When you see someone that constantly wants to argue Scripture with you and try to prove that you're right, just go ahead and pray for them and say, God, help them with their stubbornness. See, the person who's stubborn can't just say, it's okay, we disagree, we'll pray about it, we'll move on. No, no, no. They just got to keep talking about it. They just got to keep arguing with you. They got to prove. And really, it goes back to they're trying desperately to prove they're right. Again, I think a lot of it is rooted in insecurity. You're trying to be confident, so you just got to prove to everybody that you're right. That's, that's the spirit of stubbornness. And then in the end, it will manifest itself as silence. That's it. I'm just, I'm not going to engage anymore. If you won't do things my way, if you won't listen to me, then fine. I just won't talk to you. I just won't have anything to do with you. So ask God. Say, God, help me lower my defenses. Help me to become vulnerable. Again, remember, the word stubborn means to be hard-hearted. Say, God, soften my heart. You're going to find out when you get rid of stubbornness, you get the stubbornness out of your life, you're going to find out you're going to love people a lot more. You're going to experience other people's love a lot more. You're going to find out life is just better. So say, God, help me lower my defenses. Number four, stop rejecting the message. Stop rejecting wisdom and truth. Acts chapter 19, verse 9. But some became stubborn, rejecting the message. Got to make up your mind that just because the message is corrective, just because the message hurts my feelings or is forcing me to change, I'm still going to accept it if it's truth. Hello? Can I, can I let you in on a secret? Every time God speaks to you, is an oh, you're just so sweet. You're just my favorite little child in the whole wide world. Woo Way to go. Sometimes God shows up and says, you stubborn, hard-headed idiot, I need you to change now. Some, the Bible says the Holy Spirit, by the way, convicts us of sin. We talked about the need for the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when the Holy Spirit shows up, He's not there to pat you on your back and say, boy, good job. Sometimes He's there to say, you are completely wrong. You need to go repent and apologize to your spouse. You need to go to work and apologize to your boss. You need to get in the Word and start accepting the Word and stop putting buts in there. Well, I know God's Word says that, but you just need to say, that's the word of God, therefore I will do it. Stop rejecting the message just because it's uncomfortable or corrective or requires change. Finally, and the praise team can come, number five. Number five, repent and recognize the punishment for stubbornness. Repent. Look at one more scripture. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. Romans 2, verse 5. But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible judgment for yourself. Did you catch that? Because you are stubborn and refuse to turn, everybody say repent. Because that's what repenting is. It's, it's turning and going another direction. Because you are stubborn and you refuse to turn, you refuse to repent, he says you're storing up terrible punishment for yourself. Listen to me, friends. God, we've read verse after verse after verse where God says, I do not like stubbornness. He said, I'll punish for stubbornness. I'll punish harshly for stubbornness. We've read that stubbornness causes all kinds of problems in our life. It's time for you to get up off that stubbornness. Get, everybody say, get up off the sofa. Get up off the stubbornness and say, that's it. I want to have a tender and responsive heart. It's time to repent. We hope this message encouraged you and increased your faith. If you're watching on social media, make sure you share any praise reports from the message with us by commenting and be sure to like it. 
and share it with your friends and family. If you're part of our Life Church family and need to give online, or you would just like to support our many ministries and outreaches, go to lifechurchfamily.com and click online giving. It's super easy. Don't forget, more messages as well as lots of information about Life Church are available on our website, lifechurchfamily.com.